Now, I'm really not what anyone would consider an expert on the Mississippian period, but if you are an archaeologist or interested in archaeology in any capacity in North America, you're going to know about that mound. You're going to know about that mound right there. Um, it's known as Monk's Mound, alternatively the Temple Mound, and it is the largest monumental earthwork in North America. It uh, was built in successive stages. It's got two tiers and it required more labor involvement than seemingly any other construction project in the Eastern Woodlands uh, prior to colonization. So I'm standing on top of the Temple Mound at Cahokia, most often called Monk's Mound. And if I turn around, you can vaguely make out in the background the city of St. Louis right there. This is the tallest pyramid in North America, and it was built around about a thousand years ago. Uh, most of the dates are, I believe, around the 1150 AD kind of mark. But the Mississippian culture that built it predates it by a couple of hundred years. And this city, Cahokia, is the point of origin of the entire Mississippian culture. Um, the backbone of the Mississippians was maize agriculture, which came up from Mesoamerica gradually. Um, it had been there for a long time before it actually made its way into this region, the American bottom. And at its height, the city of Cahokia was, the estimates are that it was larger than the city of London was at the same, you know, at the same time, a thousand years ago, ballpark thereof. The, um, this particular culture that we call the Mississippian wound up spreading and having various permutations across the eastern woodlands. So, Later sites are Moundville around Tuscaloosa in Alabama, Etowah in Georgia, Okmulgee also in Georgia. There are sites as far north as the Great Lakes, so Wisconsin, Michigan kind of area. The Mississippians really are almost all the way across the eastern seaboard, uh, save mm, not so much New England. But this was kind of the last major um, cultural apex in the eastern woodlands prior to colonization by Europeans. Like I said, this is a temple mound, and that's not a, a metaphorical assessment. There is actually a structure that was built on top of this mound that we believe that a high priest or something of the, of the sort actually lived in. And if you walk towards the edge, the southern edge of the mound, you look out over the central plaza, which are also full of mounds. Well, which is also full of mounds. Um, all monumental earthworks constructed by humans. Unfortunately, we've gone and put a major highway straight through the damn thing, but we're actually above the tree line. Coming down the mound, you can see it easier more easily, but the Construction isn't all one level. There are terraces to the mound, so there you can see the edges of the first terrace. It slopes up to the summit of Monk's Mound, which, like I said, is where the, uh, the temple structure is housed, or was housed, rather. Um, all that's left of it now are some post holes that were excavated, I imagine, back in the 1970s when a lot of the work was first done here. Could have been later, though. I'll have to check on that. And out there in the distance, you see one of the twin mounds. The second twin mound is uh, hidden behind that oak tree there.
But the entire complex has if I, nearly 100 mounds, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. The highest numbered one I've seen is in the 70s. And one of the mounds, called Mound 72, it's a very small mound. It's not really visually impressive, but it seems to have been the uh, point that was used for the civil engineering of the entire site. The, the whole thing is laid out, oriented to Mount 72. Given all the monumental structures that you see built around Cahokia, it's really easy to forget that this isn't just a monumental site. This was, the, as far as we can tell, the largest city of its day in North America. Um, estimates put it at a higher population than, than at London. I don't have exact numbers off the top of my head, but the area behind me where the visitor center is these days, that's part of where the domestic areas were. That's, that's where the city was. If Cahokia is the city, Monk's Mound, might think of it as St. Patrick's Cathedral or something along those lines. Um, I don't know about here, I'm gonna have to go do some looking, but at other Mississippian sites, like at Moundville in Alabama, places like that, the smaller mounds are associated with specific people groups, political entities that are based around kinship ties. So it's possible that something like that was going on around here also, at least for some of these mounds. But as I say, I'm not a Mississippian expert and I don't know that off the top of my head. Part of the reason that the Mississippian culture had its formation here specifically, there, there are several variables that are contributing to this place being um, well suited to kind of an ethnogenesis like we see here at Coke. Yeah. Um, one of them is that it is right off of the Mississippi River. And for a culture that has, they don't have the horse, they don't have wagons, they can carry things with pack dogs, but the fastest way to transport people and goods anywhere is the waterways. So the Mississippi River, in particular is, is well suited to that. Something else is the entire culture was built on the back of maize agriculture. That's why they were able to develop so much food surplus in such a small space. And the river also, and kind of the, the floodplains around it are contributing to that agricultural niche. So, if it was going to be anywhere, it would be somewhere like, like here. So something else that it's really hard to grasp walking around Cahokia these days is that these mounds were not originally necessarily covered in grass. Um, I'm reminded of this from this mound over here, Mound 55, which had a veneer of black clay covering it. Now there's debate over whether or not that was meant to be seen or if the grass on it is required to prevent the mounds from eroding out too quickly. Um, I would argue that the number of people that lived here and the workforce that was here was great enough that if they wanted their mounds to be veneered in particular colors of clay, um, maintenance and upkeep would not have been all that difficult. There were plenty of people here that could easily have been responsible for maintaining the aesthetic qualities of the mound in addition to their initial construction. Now, some of the more recent research on what's going on at Cahokia and the construction and civil engineering aspects seems to be tied into the orientations of both the sun and the moon. There is a, I believe it was a five degree offset of true north um, for kind of the, the rectangular outline of the, the base points for how the city is constructed. And that five 
five degree offset is related to lunar rise and set points during particular portions of the year. I believe the equinoxes, but it could have been the, um, the solstices. I'm going to have to double check that. But we're in a very real way talking about a city of the sun and the moon that had an enormous earthen cathedral it's essentially an artificial mountain built at its center all uh, <laughs> made possible by the import of maize agriculture from Mesoamerica it's a really remarkable place and if you're ever in the St. Louis area it's definitely worth popping out to take a look but uh, you should do it soon because they're about to close the visitor center for a year for um, refurbishing and uh, in upkeep. Now, ironically, every time I come here, the last place I stop is in a lot of ways where it all began here at the Woodhenge. This is the area where archaeologists noticed that a lot of the geometry of the city. Uh, it, it tends to converge on this area as though it was the kind of the point of origin or the, the mapping point that was used to lay out everything else. And the actual center of that was a spot called Mound 72, which is associated with Woodhenge, which is what we see here behind me, a series of 48 posts uh, arranged in a circle with a central post that has alignments to the summer and winter solstices. But Mound 72 is, is the mound that um, if you're an archaeology student you're going to end up reading more about than anything else at Cahokia because even though it's extremely small, in fact I can't even see where it is out here, the contents of that mound were entirely unique to this site. A set of individuals is buried on a pile of shell beads. If I remember imported from the ocean, they're not riverine species. And dozens of other humans are interred surrounding them. So the thought is that this was part of some sort of um, some sort of a human sacrifice. Whether that's true or not, I'm not entirely certain, but it is certainly a possibility. Now, the wood hinge itself is also interesting outside of its association with Mount 72 because it was built and rebuilt five times. Um, the last one does not seem to be incomplete. If the last one had been complete, it would have been about 72 posts um, in circumference, whereas this one's only 48. Uh, but the, the final version, Woodhinge 5, was uh, only facing east, it appears. So 48 is the one that they've reconstructed here with cedar posts. And it's an imposing feature on the landscape. So as I said already, if you get a chance to come visit, uh, if you're in the St. Louis area, uh, highly recommended. It's, uh, it's a, it is a magic and mythic landscape that these people built a thousand years ago. Um, even if you get here when the Interpretive Center and Museum are closed, still worth it. But like I said, they are going to close for renovations for about a year starting, I believe. Uh, I believe they said in May. Uh, I guess that's all I've got for this one. Um, this one was really ad hoc. It was just based on stuff that I remember and things that were written on some of the placards around uh, that jo helped jog my memory. So if I said anything incorrect, I'll uh, put a, a note on screen to correct myself. As always, if there are any questions, you can leave those in the comments, and thank you for watching.